Perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Salman, one of the co-founders of CamSign with my colleague Mohammed here today. So we're very excited to have another uh, episode of uh, the Women in Neurosurgery series. This is a series that's been very popular and we've been very pleased to have quite a lot of wonderful role models uh, that have been doing incredible work in neurosurgery and I'm very, very excited that Dr. Adam has joined us for today's session. And uh, just briefly, uh, Dr. Adam will be stopping during her PowerPoint slides uh, four questions. If you have questions, you can either put it in the chat and then you can ask it when it begins or you can just unmute the microphones. Both options are very, very possible. Okay, great. I'll pass it on to my colleague, Mohammed. Yeah, hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Mohammed, one of the other co-founders of CamSign. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Adam um, for today's meeting. So I'm just going to give you the short introduction to Dr. Adams. Um, Dr. Idara Adam is a Canadian trained neurosurgeon. Uh, she graduated from the University of Toronto with an honors bachelor's in neuroscience and double minors in psychiatry and African studies. She attended medical school at Queen's University and completed her neurosurgery residency at the Ottawa Hospital, University of Ottawa. During her residency, she also earned a master's degree in global health and global surgery from King's College of London while performing research in South Africa. Following residency, she completed a neurosurgical oncology skull-based fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She has conducted research and published manuscripts related to general neurosurgery and skull-based neurosurgery, especially regarding minimal access approaches and including papers on quality of life. She also has avid clinical and research interests in the provision of neurosurgical care in low and middle income countries and the policy changes needed to improve access to surgical care worldwide. Dr. Adam is an assistant professor at Michigan State University. She serves as director of skull base and neurosurgical oncology at the Inside Institute of Neurosurgery and Neuroscience, which she joined in October 2020. Her specialties include general neurosurgery, neurosurgical oncology, and skull based neurosurgery. She's also affiliated with the Carmanos Cancer Institute, McLaren Flint Regional Medical Center, and uh, Ascension Genesis Hospital in Michigan. Dr. Adam, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to give the talk. Um, I hope that you guys can take this as a very informal session where you can ask all the questions that you want to ask. I have points during the presentation where I can stop for questions, um, and I will be as honest as possible. Um, and really, I think this is a, a learning and investigative experience for you guys. I, I wish that I had something like this when I was in your shoes. So be free to ask whatever questions you have. Um, so this is just going to be a quick talk about trajectories to neurosurgery, and this is my trajectory to neurosurgery. Um, let's begin. So I am um, very quick outline. We'll talk just about the scholarly aspects of things first and my path through to um, neurosurgery residency training fellowship and all of that. Then we'll have a little discussion about uh, representation and EDI. And then for those who are interested or who um, are just curious, a little bit of a talk about global surgery and neurosurgery as well. So for me, I didn't always want to be a neurosurgeon. Um, there was a point in my life when I knew nothing about neurosurgery. Um, in high school, I wanted to go into communications. I wanted to be a broadcaster. Um, my dad was in communications, and so I thought, yeah, this is interesting. I love it. Um, it wasn't until, I would say, high school, the end of high school, pretty much, that I was exposed to the neurosciences, and then I became obsessed with the brain. So then I quickly changed um, my plan for undergrad, and so went to U of T to do my um, specialist degree in, in neuroscience. Um, at that time, I think there were only two universities in Ontario that were offering neuroscience programs. I think that was Broad in, at Brock University and U of T, but um, U of T was closer and there was more variety. So U of T it was. Um, the good thing about, you know, neuroscience program there was, you know, you were exposed to everything from the research aspect to clinical to all of the knowledge and faculty from all over the world who are experts. So that was great. Um, I didn't still decide about neurosurgery during um, 
undergrad. I basically was making the decision towards the middle of undergrad about medical school versus research. And because I wanted more hands-on learning, I wanted to take care of people, medical school. So, but during my undergrad degree, um, I did a minor in African studies um, because that is an interest of mine. I, I was born and raised in Nigeria. Um, and I've always had this idea of somehow going back home and, and contributing in some way or another. So um, just learning a bit more about that. Um, I applied for medical school and thankfully got accepted to Queens. Um, it was a great program, great exposure. It was a very a smaller class compared to a lot of other medical schools. So you got really you know, good hands-on learning early on and good um, development of relationships with the faculty as well. Um, so I had a very good experience at Queens. Now, um, during medical school, um, at Queens, there wasn't a neurosurgery program. Um, what I did for myself was that I wanted to expose myself to everything um, neuro related. So I did the electives and everything. So neurology, um, I went to other places for neurosurgery, physical med and rehab, all of this stuff. Cause I really wanted to make sure and choose what I think was best for me. At the end of the day, I picked neurosurgery because um, it allows me to do neuroscience, but also to work with my hands and get results that way. So um, the high paced environment of it and making quick decisions and the impact that you can have on people's lives um, really drew me um, to neurosurgery. Um, at Queens, there was no neurosurgery residency program. Um, there were neurosurgeons at Queens. So there was some exposure, but not very much. Um, so it was important to go to other places and seek mentors elsewhere um, too. Um, after my first year at um, Queens, I did a global health elective in Kenya during that summer. Um, because, you know, this whole idea of global health um, has always been a, an aspect of my learning that I've continued throughout. And it just kind of helps solidify for me um, the idea of the importance of surgery. Um, and so it kind of helped feed that decision about proceeding with neurosurgery as opposed to neurology, for example. I actually remember getting um, asked a lot during my um, medical school career, why I wanted to do neurosurgery, um, because apparently I was too nice to do neurosurgery, because um, apparently all neurosurgeons are not nice, apparently, I don't know. Um, but a lot of people would talk to me, work with me and tell me, oh, I think you would be more fitted for neurology, or oh, I think you would be more fitted for something else like that. But so you will hear things like that a lot, um, depending on your situation. Um, I actually, I did one of my neurosurgery electives in Dalhousie. So I really wanted to go to different places and explore different places and see what was up. Um, and one of the residents there, uh, female residents, Julia Radic, I think you had her on one of your talks uh, recently. She's um, currently in Saskatchewan. So she was there and I remember having candid conversations with her about pursuing a career in neurosurgery. And at the time, one of the things that she said, and I don't know if she was kidding or being serious, but one of the things she said was, if you can see yourself doing anything else, don't do neurosurgery. And, you know, that might have been said in just, you know, dealing with the stresses of life as a resident in neurosurgery and all of that. But at the end of the day, I do actually believe that because if you can really see yourself doing anything else, then neurosurgery is probably not the career for you. Um, I really think this should be pursued by people who, you know, it's a, it's a calling in a way. Um, it does take a toll on your life in all aspects, and it does take a lot of work and balance to be able to have a good, solid, productive career in neurosurgery. Um, so yeah, now I tell people that if you can really see yourself doing anything else, don't do neurosurgery. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, I did a bunch of electives everywhere and then, you know, CARMS came around traveling and doing all your, showing yourself to other people and seeing what the other environments are like. Um, I ended up matching to U Ottawa. Um, one of the reasons why I ranked it very high was I hadn't even done an elective at U of Ottawa, but when I went there for my interview, I really liked the group of people that were there. Um, very specifically, there was a neurosurgeon there, Dr. Charles Agby. Um, so he's a Black neurosurgeon, um, but he's one of these people who 
just knows everything about everything. His brain is like an encyclopedia, but also just a very kind, humanistic kind of individual. And so I was very drawn to that. Um, and, you know, the structure of the program at that time and all these things. So basically, by the end of my interview process, I had re-ranked everything completely differently than what I had thought at the beginning. But anyways, I went to U of Ottawa and it was a really great experience. Um, it's, a, it's a good program because they have such a large catchment area of patients. They have experts in everything um, neurosurgery related. So a lot of different programs will not have, say, like a peripheral nerve specialist or a functional neurosurgeon or something, but they really did have everything. So you got exposure to everything early on. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated about the Ottawa program was that you really got to learn hands-on right from the beginning. So in talking to my other colleagues and other um, um, in other locations, you know, the U Ottawa residents, you were able to start doing a lot right from day one. You know, in your first year up to your second year, the gradation of responsibility is obviously getting higher as you go along, but you really were able to get hands on very quickly. So I really appreciated that. And at U Ottawa, I had Dr. Aggie, who was a great mentor for me because he was also a skull based neurosurgeon. Um, a neurosurgical oncologist, and I had kind of developed an interest um, in oncology. Um, so during med school, actually, I um, one of the summers there before elective started, I did a research summer with um, Dr. Zade in Toronto, and she kind of piqued my interest um, in oncology. And I know you, you guys have had a talk with her as well, but she's one of those people who's just such a wonderful mentor. She has so many people that she works with and that she mentors, but she still finds time to invest in them in multiple ways. You know, I had a great summer of research with her um, and was able to get some publications out of that, but she continued to be a mentor throughout. So I remember her, you know, calling me the night before, you know, my first um, interviews for residency and like, walking me through some of the questions and I got to like review them with her and giving me advice about things to talk about and not to talk about. So simple things like that, that, you know, really do mean a lot over the years. And throughout my career, she has been there. I can call her, ask her questions. And it was kind of surreal when I got to the end of residency and she was actually sitting there as an examiner for our oral um, exams and it was kind of like a full circle moment. But um, yeah, mentors like that are really important. Um, so, you know, I started into neurosurgical oncology. I knew that's what I wanted to pursue. So Dr. Agby was great as a mentor for that and really got me early on, um, you know, working on tumors early on, learning the skills that you need to learn. Um, and resident, you know, life in residency is busy in neurosurgery residency. Um, there are a lot of responsibilities that you have to pick up pretty quickly. Um, your first year, you're pretty much, you know, trying to learn and get your footing. Um, so it's a lot of, a lot of learning at the beginning. Um, your second year, you're kind of settled. You're starting to do a little bit more neurosurgery. And then all of a sudden, between second year and third year, the level of responsibility just goes sky high. So all of a sudden, you're like, it's like, okay, now you have the basics. So here you go, run with it. There's just so much more to do. And you start to do much more in the OR. You start to get much more responsibility in the OR. So um, it does start to become very, very serious and very um, taxing and um, very busy. Um, but at the end of the day, if you love what you do, then you love it and you just do it because it's fun. Um, but, you know, it's life. It's busy. Um, so the, the importance of the learning continuum is, is very clear in neurosurgery. So you go from being, you know, the initial learner where you're basically watching procedures, asking questions. So, you know, on the left, someone is doing a trigeminal neuralgia procedure. Um, and then, you know, you go to the point where you're actually able to start doing procedures, helping your surgeons, 
Um, and you know, you go from opening and closing to starting to actually take out a little bit of tumor and do some dissection. And you know, they're teaching you um, through that process. And then you get to the point where then you're the senior resident and you're actually teaching your juniors how to perform these procedures. And that continuum of learning um, is really important. And how fast you go through that will depend on this foundation that you have at the beginning. Um, and, you know, for me, I was very lucky to have really great teachers at U of Ottawa. Um, one of them is Dr. Moulton. He's the guy in the center there. So he's a kind of, he's a kind of surgeon who's seen it all and done it all. Okay. So he um, was very quick. So he expects you to be quick. So you have to learn to be quick very quickly with him. Um, but if you do a day of surgery with him, you'll number one, get to do more surgery than with any other surgeons. And number two, you'll get to learn really good skills to you know, get yourself out of trouble really quickly at any point. So he's one of those surgeons who's just you know, a great technical surgeon. Um, during my residency, I decided to go ahead and um, do a master's in global health and global surgery. So I went to King's College London um, in, in the UK for that. Um, one, because I wanted to do something different and two, because I'd always had this idea of global health and I wanted to explore that more when it comes to the surgery aspect and you know what exactly is happening research-wise. What do we know about what the issues are and the burden of disease and what are we doing to combat that? So um, it was a great experience for me. I went and did some of my research in South Africa for my capstone project and, you know, got some publications that, about that. I'll talk about that later if you guys are interested. Um, and then, you know, coming back after your, um, after your time off for research, pretty much almost everyone does research in neurosurgery. Um, it's pretty much necessary in most programs. Um, there's a gradation in terms of what you do. So you can go from doing, you know, take a year off to do a master's, take four to six years off to do a PhD, whatever the case may be, you still got to do some sort of research. So it's important to find your interests when it comes to that early on. Um, when you go away and you come back, um, there is kind of a learning curve coming back because you kind of have to relearn some of the things that you already know um, and become comfortable in the operating room again. Um, so being in a place like Ottawa where you have so much activity and there's so many cases all the time, it's always busy, that learning curve, you know, happens much more quickly. Um, and then, you know, you finish your residency as a senior, you go ahead and you write your exams. And then you, for me, I decided to pursue a fellowship um, in skull-based neurosurgery. So I went to MD Anderson for that. Um, and the two skull-based surgeons are there, Dr. Raza and Dr. DeMonte. Um, one does more endoscopic cases and the younger guy, Dr. Raza. And Dr. DeMonte is more of the old school, open lateral skull base, everything open kind of um, cases. Um, and that was really a wonderful experience when it comes to learning more about multidisciplinary care because it's it's very strate strategic when it comes to providing care for these patients um, and all of the different teams that are involved to get the patients through their illnesses and um, coming out on the other side in terms of their quality of life, um, really key. Um, so we talked a little bit about research, but um, it's really important early on to explore your options. Um, to make use of every single opportunity um, from the beginning. So um, you will, you know, you'll be in class one day in a lecture or in the OR and, you know, one of your staff will mention, oh, I was having this idea about this, that, or whatever. Talk to them about it. Um, you know, firm up a plan with them, start a project with them. It, these opportunities come all the time, but it's based on your interest and your initiative a lot of the time. So actually get some of the projects started, especially if you're not in a center where, you know, there's a very strong academic program. Um, some of that will rely on you to, you know, move that along. Um, so it's important to find the things that you're interested in, in um, when it comes to research in neurosurgery. You know, do you like basic science research? Do you like clinical research? Um, and what subspecializations of neurosurgery are you interested in? Is it skull-based oncology? Is it, you know, vascular? Is it 
peripheral nerve, functional, whatever the case may be. Um, so find your interests early and then establish mentors in those um, research arenas. Um, you will have projects that you start and then they never get finished or someone else has to pick it up and finish it. But, you know, making collaborations and joining teams is important, but you have to keep that going through time. Um, it's, it's important to present your research. So um, these are just some of the organizations where I've presented during my residency. Um, so you, you do your research, you fight it through, to, through the end. You have to get that message out and present. Um, at meetings, and it's also important that you publish because this is all important for when when you come to a residency um, interview or when you come for uh, an interview for a job. You know, people are going to look at your credentials when it comes to this. So um, that part of it is important as well. Um, so for me, those are just some of my interests there, and those are some of the um, research things that I've done in the past. Um, but you kind of have to find your own and start working on that and developing connections um, to be able to get your name out there and publish. Um, so this is, for example, one of the projects that I did um, during my fellowship, looking at sarcomas of the skull base and quality of life and um, looking at factors impacting um, disease control and patient survival. Um, and, you know, OK, so we found um, if you had prior radiation treatment or if you had cavernous sinus involvement um, for your tumor, then you know your um, predict that was a poor predictor, and if you had gross total resection with negative margins, great predictor. So these are things that will then influence the planning for um, patients when they come into our clinic and our multidisciplinary discussions in terms of what to do for their for their treatments. Um, a quick thing about you know neurosurgery exams. So <laughs> it's kind of early on for you guys for this, but we have an oral and a written exam. So um, a lot of the difficult initial parts of it is the written exam because one, you're expected to know everything and two, you won't remember everything. So <laughs> this kind of came along a lot during our studying period. Just keep calm, just study, it's gonna be okay. Um, but so one of the things that I did um, when, after, when I was done my exam and I had just um, finished and was doing my fellowship was I came back um, to the um, Ottawa Neurosurgery Review course to give a talk about preparing for the certification exam. Um, now, the Ottawa Review course is something that pretty much every resident in Canada will come to that course. Um, during their fifth year or their sixth year or both, um, because it's like a review of all of neurosurgery and all the things that you need to know for your exam. And you have um, attendings and staff from all across Canada and outside of Canada um, coming to teach. It's like a one week intense um, kind of learning experience. Um, so Anyways, I gave the talk there. And one of the things that I remember the most about that is really that anatomy is key. So whether you're just starting or whether whatever point in your career that you're in, anatomy is key. So um, Dr. Moulton, who was one of my mentors would always say, if you know your anatomy, you'll be served well in whatever situation you find yourself. So I remember as a first year resident, he would quiz us all the time on anatomy, especially peripheral nerve anatomy, goodness gracious. But it's important to have that base of knowledge from the start because it makes your life so much easier later on. And, you know, looking at tips for studying for the exam, but it's it applies to everything. You really kind of have to find a balance in your life throughout. For me, it's like traveling and exploring different places, um, I love exploring different cultures and music um, and cuisine, um, you know, exercising, yoga, I cycle, basically the things that you need to keep you sane. You need that structure right from the beginning up until the end. It never ends. So it's important that you develop, you know, a certain kind of structure for yourself in terms of a support network, whether it's the people in your lives, the relationships that you form. Um, the things that you do that you enjoy, that give you energy, um, that pour into you um, positively, um, those things you need to keep um, throughout your you know, medical school and throughout residency as well. 
Um, so another thing that I did when I um, when I left was, you know, coming back to give this talk on chordomas and chondrosarcomas, which are um, um, skull based tumors. So this talk, when I was a resident, was always given by one of my mentors, um, Dr. DeMonte um, from MD Anderson. And so it was kind of a full circle, wonderful moment when they asked me to come and give that talk at the review course um, for Dr. DeMonte. So anyways. One, just, you know, things to always give back. Um, and again, it's all about anatomy. It is all about anatomy. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, going through medical school and going through residency, there are certain things that I found were most important for me in terms of um, surviving, but most importantly, thriving. Um, during those moments. So resiliency, obviously, um, it is going to be a lot of work and you're going to work hard. Um, you do have to persevere through situations that are crazy. You know, sometimes I remember, you know, one night during residency, I literally felt like I was like a harbinger of death. You know, I had like you know, five patients who are dying from different neurosurgical conditions. And I was basically going from one room to the other telling families that their, you know, their family members were, were dead and they had to take them off the ventilator and all these other things. And sometimes you have hard days like that where you feel like nothing you're doing is right and nothing you're doing is helpful to people. Um, and that's when you'll need that support network to really help get you through those moments. But you know, the thing that keeps you going is the knowledge that this is something that you love, um, the positivity that you see when things do go right, and the positive impact you're able to make on patients' lives and their families' lives as well. Um, but anyways, um, collaboration, uh, mentorship is so, so, so important. It's sometimes difficult to develop mentorship relationships. It's sometimes difficult to find a good mentor that fits what you want and who you are. Sometimes you'll find that you have different mentors for different aspects of your life, um, whether it's a research mentor, an academic mentor, or a clinical mentor, or just a life mentor in general. Um, these all kind of build and feed into each other. So don't be afraid to have multiple mentors as long as you feel that they're feeding into you positively. Um, but yeah, that, that support network is definitely key. Um, so I can stop there and um, take some questions. Please raise your hand if you have any question, or you can just uh, open your mic and uh, ask a question directly. Hi, um, I have a quick question. Um, thank you so very much for the talk. It was so incredibly interesting. I was wondering if maybe you could um, share a few like practical tips. I'm in my first year of medical school and neurosurgery is definitely something I'm considering. And I was wondering what your thoughts would be on like just practical steps I could take in my first few years of medical school and then going into clerkship and my final fourth year um, to prepare me for that neurosurgical residency and those applications. Okay. Um, so early on, I think it's important to, where are you doing your medical school? I'm at the University of British Columbia. Okay, so it's important early on to find um, mentors. So in the neurosurgery program, um, basically you want to expose yourself to neurosurgery as much as possible. So whether that's, um, you know, meeting neurosurgery residents or the neurosurgery staff, um, you know, going to some of their talks and their lectures, um, doing, well, the first thing I started with was just doing observerships. So I would contact a neurosurgeon and I would say, okay, I'm this person and I wanted to come see your surgery or I wanted to come, um, you know, just observe you in clinic and see what's going on. And so that way you kind of get yourself introduced to people in neurosurgery um, in your area. Um, and you then start to get exposed to the neurosurgery residents as well. Now your um, electives before clerkship will be really helpful in finding out more about the neurosurgery resident life. Um, so, you know, really learning hands-on what it's like to be a neurosurgery resident um, as a medical student meant for me when I went on my electives, 
I actually stayed with the neurosurgery residents. So wherever they went, I went. If they slept, then I went to sleep. If um, they were up all night, then I was up all night, you know? So you basically um, form relationships with people in neurosurgery so that you can learn some more about neurosurgery and whether or not it's the right fit for you. Um, I also would recommend, you know, starting to think about research in neurosurgery. Um, and so when you um, approach any of the staff neurosurgeons, um, you can find out what their interests are and what research they do. Um, and you can find out if there are any opportunities for you to be involved and to participate. Um, and so if you can get started on research early, then you can hopefully have um, a couple of publications by the time it comes for um, those interviews. Um, so observerships early on, electives um, and research, um, I, would, I would think would be the key things for you. Starting, starting early is, is good, um, but you wanna make sure that you've exposed yourself to you know, everything and to really make sure that you know, neurosurgery is a thing that you want to pursue. Um, I think um, doing electives in non-neurosurgical programs is also a good thing. So for me, I did some electives in, in neurology, for example, which is really good because you do get important foundational blocks that will then be helpful for you in neurosurgery later on. Um, you know, you can sit for two hours in a neurosurgery meeting and discuss one patient's presentation and uh, why they're presenting that way, what part pathways in the brain are involved and all of these other things that, you know, is knowledge that will be building blocks for you in the future. So um, I think those, those um, encounters were very helpful for me as well. Um, so I hope that was helpful. It was incredibly helpful. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Actually, I have a question as well, Dr. Adam. So thank you so much for a great talk. I really enjoyed um, the talk so far. Uh, so I have a question regarding the, the interview process. So you mentioned that there are some tips and hints that could be really helpful for the interview. Some of us are going to apply this year for residency. Do you have any specific tips and hints about the interviews that you can share with us? So for neurosurgery residency interviews? Yes. Okay. So um, I will speak as, you know, my experience during the residency interview process, but also as someone who interviewed um, a couple of you guys and, well, your former um, predecessors um, for neurosurgery positions. So the number one rule when we look at neurosurgery um, applicants is no assholes allowed, being very, very blunt. So basically you're going to have to live with this person for the next six years. Okay. And your lives are going to be very intertwined <laughs> from the beginning to the end. So you have to make sure that you're, you're letting in someone that, you know, you can work with professionally over those six years, but you know, that at the end of the day, you can also just, you know, spend time with outside of work. If you, if you wanted to do that, but you know, someone that you think is reliable and dependable and works hard and is resourceful. Oh my goodness. It's so important to be resourceful as a resident um, in neurosurgery. Cause a lot of the time you're, you need to take initiative and you need to do work and you need to not wait for someone to always tell you what to do all the time. So it's really important to be able to show initiative and resourcefulness early on. So the number one rule is a no assholes. Um, the other thing we look at, because when everyone, when you look at the paper, you know, everyone on paper looks pretty similar at the end of the day. So when the applicants come in, you have, you know, all of your um, electives, your great medical school marks, um, some of the research that you've done, and you're showing that you have interest in your surgery across the board. Um, and you generally, at the end of the day, pretty much most people look very, very similar. Now there are some people who will be, you know, experts in some other things who've had other lives outside of neurosurgery or um, who have just done a lot of research and have published a lot, that's great. But at the end of the day, we want a well-rounded individual. So if I look at your application and I see that 
all you've done is neurosurgery. I mean, that's great, but it doesn't really tell me much about you as a person. So it's really important to have a kind of well-balanced, well-rounded um, application. Um, and that doesn't mean you go around doing a whole bunch of things that you're not interested in, because we want to see that you're committed to the things that you do, um, because that really does show that you have a level of commitment that will stay through neurosurgery. Um, it's a program where, you know, there is some recidiv recidivism. So there are people who will drop out of the neurosurgery program a lot and pursue other programs during their residency. So when we let someone in, it's really important for us to see if, you know, this is someone who can really hack it out in neurosurgery throughout the six years of residency. Um, yeah, those are some of the things that I would think about in terms of the residency, the interview process. Basically, as long as you come in, you show that you're interested and what you've done in the past so far has demonstrated that interest as well. You're not an asshole. You can answer questions and be professional about it um, and you're honest, then, you know, that's a pretty good place to start. Um, it doesn't serve you well to be dishonest during your um, interview process. We have had episodes of that in the past um, because we will query you about different things on your resume not necessarily the things related to neurosurgery it could be completely random. Um, so it's important to present a front that is the authentic you and not necessarily what you think we want to see. Thank you so much, that was very helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, Dr. Hi. Oh, Hi. sorry, you go ahead, go ahead. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for your talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question. I am a, from a Quebec medical school, and I was just wondering, for me, uh, the language barrier is uh, a little bit one of my personal challenges. So I am worrying during the residency interview program, since I would have to learn everything again in English, will it kind of affect my uh, my application? Um. That is, that's a tough one to answer because, uh, you know, I don't have that experience. What I experienced during residency when it came to, when it came to um, applicants from Quebec was that, unfortunately, a lot, most of them ended up in Quebec programs. Um, and, you know, some of them in McGill and some of them in other locations, but um, there seemed to be kind of a differentiation between the French speaking and the English speaking um, neurosurgery residents. And that carried through throughout residency as well. So most of them were concentrated in Quebec. We rarely had a resident outside of, from Quebec in the other um, neurosurgery locations across the country, um, unless they were actually um, also pretty English speaking, because it's, it, it, it it can be difficult to get your point across um, if you do have that language barrier. And, um, you know, I mean, the information is the same. Nothing has changed about the information, but being able to interact with patients and get the information that you need to care for them um, can be problematic if there is that language barrier all the time. And I mean, you know, sometimes even in Ottawa, you know, we're dual speaking. So we, a lot of the time we'll have patients from Quebec and other areas who only speak French. And so there's a language barrier there where you're kind of putting together English and French to try to get the point across. But, you know, that's just every now and then, not all the time. So I can imagine if it's all the time that might present quite a big barrier in terms of doing a residency program outside of Quebec. But I'm sure that, you know, it, it, I'm sure it has happened in the past. I would suggest that you speak with, um, I mean, your, some of the programs there might be able to give you more information about that um, and maybe refer you to someone who may have gone through that experience in the past and, you know, what they were able to do to circumvent it. So um, I would say talk to the people either in the neurosurgery uh, program or in the, um, the, um, the faculty of medicine, like their office, to see if there's, um, there are ways for you to get around that barrier. 
Good. Well, thank you. It was very insightful. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, sorry, I cut you off there. But thank you so much for giving this talk. This is so helpful. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit more um, on your decision to do a master's in global health as opposed to a PhD. Um, just because for me personally, one of the things that I guess I've been told as someone that's interested in neurosurgery is that I will have to do a PhD. And if I don't, that'll really affect my career options. Um, so just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about your decision to do a master's and if that's affected your career prospects or not. Yeah. Um, so I don't think having a master's versus a PhD will necessarily negatively affect your career path very much unless you want to end up in a specific program that is known to be very PhD driven. So as long as you actually do a postgraduate degree, whether it's a master's or a PhD, it does actually expand your horizons in terms of the programs that you can match to and the work you can find afterwards. It doesn't have to be a PhD unless you're actually looking to be in a specific program that you know really looks at that very heavily and ranks that very heavily. Um, for me, when it came to doing a master's versus a PhD, I initially started with a master's and I was kind of thinking about it. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, number one, I knew that I didn't want to do, um, I knew that I, I missed the OR too much. That was the first thing. I couldn't really see myself spending another two to four years doing research, just research without being able to be in the OR. Because for me, that's my happy place. So um, I know it's a short period of time, but just within that time when I was doing my master's, I really did feel the difference. So I, I couldn't see myself staying for, for more time to get a PhD. I was approached to do a PhD by my, by my supervisor who I did my capstone, which in South Africa. But at the end of the day, I just couldn't see myself doing it. Um, and in terms of doing, you know, a master's in global health and global surgery, I mean, that's where my interest was and that's what I was passionate about and that's what I wanted to pursue. Um, you know, lots of people will say, you know, you need to do a basic science research and get a PhD for that to get a really big job in an academic center. Um, but at the end of the day, I know I'm not a basic science research person. I... I know that that is not where my interest lies. I'm more of a clinical research person. And so um, I had to make that decision for myself to do the thing that I'm passionate about and to do the thing that um, I know that I'm interested in and that I can most, um, um, I guess, provide um, some sort of assistance or um, introduce my kind of expertise into that arena. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, I don't think the master's versus PhD thing is so much of a thing anymore, unless you want to end up in a very specific role, especially when it comes to basic science research. Thank you so much. That was really helpful and reassuring. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so if, if there are no more questions right now, um, we could kind of um, proceed with the rest of the presentation and feel free to stop and ask questions as we go along. So um, when it comes, this is a women in neurosurgery um, seminar. Um, and you know, when it comes to women in neurosurgery, there is no kind of question about it, like the numbers are clear, there's no hiding it, you know, and it, it applies to a lot of different surgical specialties, but most especially, you know, neurosurgery and for example, um, card cardiosurgery as well. But in neurosurgery, the numbers are very clear. So in 2019, there are about 333 neurosurgeons in Canada and only about 36 of them were women. So less than 11% or so. Um, and you know, that is, there are many different reasons, reasons and many different biases that have occurred over the years for that to be the case, you know, um, and we talk about that in more detail if you want to, but at the end of the day, we know that there's a need for diversity and inclusion, um, and 
to really move forward and move the needle across in Canada and all over the world, there has to be a systematic effort and a concerted effort to make changes, to be able to improve representation of women in neurosurgery. Um, and that really does come from a top-down kind of approach. Um, allyship when it comes to the dominant um, gender in neurosurgery and those who are in hiring positions and up there in the faculty who are making the decisions about who to let into neurosurgery residency um, and who to hire for neurosurgery jobs. Um, they're the ones who need to be better exposed to, you know, the discrepancies that are currently um, ongoing in neurosurgery and the changes that need to be made for that to happen. So if those people aren't involved, it's gonna take so much longer for um, representation in women, for women in neurosurgery to improve. So when you have people like, you know, Dr. Zade, who at U of T is literally making um, a concerted effort to hire more women, to get more women in, in neurosurgery residency, um, and it's not so much about just getting women in neurosurgery. It's more about not denying people who are just as talented and just as interested um, the opportunity to be able to pursue that career for various different reasons. And so when you start to actually create that space, for people to thrive and to come in and do the work and show that the work can be done, then we can actually start to see um, changes in numbers for that. Um, so another aspect of representation in neurosurgery for me is as a black female in neurosurgery. So in Canada, I'm the only black female neurosurgeon. Okay, so why hasn't that happened in the past? So for me, there's, um, kind of a divide when it comes to neurosurgery and representation from the aspect of race and from the aspect of gender as well. Um, so there are things that, you know, I have done and I continue to do um, to help increase knowledge about representation in neurosurgery and just to spread the word more about neurosurgery. So people, you know, in high school, in undergrad, in medical school, just, you know, you start to actually think about neurosurgery as a career option and not limit your idea of what you can and can't do um, based on what you've been told or what you haven't seen in the past. Um, so for example, I give one of these talks to one of the high schools um, here um, in Michigan, um, just about representation and about career paths in neurosurgery. Um, when it comes to mentorship um, and representation, um, there are different organizations in Ontario and now across Canada um, to help increase representation when it comes to equality, diversity, and inclusion in different classes, whether it's race or gender um, or whatever the case may be. So for me, these are some of the people that have been the most important when it comes to mentorship and guiding me through my career in neurosurgery. And I've mentioned some of them or all of them already, but you know, Dr. Zade, right from the beginning in medical school, really getting me interested in oncology uh, and starting my research um, kind of career in neurosurgery as well. Um, Dr. Agby, who was really the reason I went to the University of Ottawa um, and you know, just growing that um, interest in oncology and, you know, making the, making the emphasis on not just becoming a neurosurgical expert, but, you know, becoming a surgeon who, like, who actually cares for their patients and who takes that into consideration in all of the decisions that they make for their patients. Because you can be a great technical expert. You know, if you learn, you can go there and you can do the job, take out the brain tumor, fix the spine, whatever the case may be. But what you don't learn early on is that a lot of neurosurgery is all the work that you do with the patients and with their families outside of the OR. Um, so, you know, Dr. Moulton and Dr. DeMonte and now my boss here in Michigan, Dr. Shaw, um, these are all people who've kind of fed into the kind of neurosurgeon that I have become. Um, and I, you know, I continue to aspire to be, you know, different aspects of who they are and what they represent to me when it comes to neurosurgery. And, you know, that's the thing I like about it. It's a continued growth and learning experience throughout the years and never ends. Um, as a new um, neurosurgery staff, 
Um, I'm taking things that I've learned from all of these people and bringing it into my career now. Um, everyone, when they operate, they think that their way is the best way of doing things. And you as a resident, you pick up all of their best ways and then you put it together and that becomes your own best way of doing things. So it's always a continued um, learning activity and there will never be... Um, You'll never come to a point where you say, you know, you know everything and then you've seen everything and taken care of everything. There are always things that surprise you in neurosurgery. And um, that's one of the aspects that I really enjoy about neurosurgery. So at the end of the day, if it is something that you're passionate about, if it, you really is, if it, it really is something that, you know, you can't see yourself doing anything else but this, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Don't let anyone put a stumbling block in front of you because of whatever reason. Um, if, if you really think that this is something that you want, you can do it. That's the end of it. Like you basically make connections through the years and you develop relationships and you get yourself, you know, in the right research um, groups and get publications. You learn, you, you're humble, you um, receive criticism, constructive criticism. You learn from your mistakes and you grow because at the end of the day, we're all learning throughout and we're all, you know, making mistakes as we go along. But at the end of the day, you learn way more from your mistakes than you learn from anything else. Um, everyone is going to have a complication at some point. It's just a matter of when. Um, and I remember when they told me that earlier on, and that was a very scary thing. But at the end of the day, you're going to have a complication no matter how great you are, because you're working on an area of the body that is so unpredictable at times. We know so much about the brain, but we also know so little about the brain. Um, so there will you there will come a time when you have a complication and it's it's not so much that you know um you have a complication and then you know you're sad about it and then you move on um it's more the learning from the complication so the thing that i did to cause a complication in the past i'll never do that again because i learned from that situation and um, you know, it's stuck in my head. It's like branded in my head. So everything I do moving forward, I make sure that I avoid that complication or I avoid that thing that I did um, to cause that complication. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, if that's what you want to do, you can do it. Um, any other questions? We can stop for some questions there before moving forward. I have actually a question. So since you practice both in Canada and US, so I was wondering how do you compare the the, the like the difference in the, the number of the certain women and, and, and men neurosurgeons in Canada and US? And if, if there's a difference, what, what do you think is the cause of the difference and then how we can um, learn from the from the other country to just improve this like the gap between the genders in neurosurgery? So, I mean, there's definitely still a gender gap in neurosurgery um, in the US. Um, the only difference in the US is that there are more neurosurgeons in general compared to in Canada. And so that also means that there are more female neurosurgeons in general, but the ratios are actually very similar. Um, so the same problem exists here. And again, it's once you are in, especially if you're in bigger centers, once you're in places of you know, decision-making and you have people in those positions who um, are knowledgeable about this gap and are interested in improving diversity across the board, um, then they make decisions that will impact change over the years. And so you'll see some pockets of the US where, um, you know, the residency programs there are almost 50-50 when it comes to male versus female. And then you'll see other places where there's maybe one or two females throughout all of the years of residency. So it really does vary and it really does take an effort in you know, people recognizing that there's a problem and trying to actually do something about that. Um, but yes, the, the gap definitely still, it exists in the US, it exists everywhere around the world, but um, yeah, it's just a matter of actually, you know, acknowledging that there is a problem and then trying to do something to actually fix it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about um, global uh, surgery and global neurosurgery. So, um, and you know, this is one of the quotes from the pro Harvard program in global surgery and social change where, you know, it's not so much about how to perform neurosurgery better, it's more about providing 
providing neurosurgical care to those who don't have it. So um, one of my mentors there is Dr. Key Park, who um, you know has done this huge assessments of the global neurosurgery workforce and you know what is actually needed in different countries um, based on what is available and based on the number of procedures that are done and there's such a huge gap between what is needed and what is, what is currently present and so you know the next step is you know how do you then fill that gap over the years? What are the things that need to change when it comes to workforce, um, when it comes to you know, production materials, hospitals, surgical systems, um, to be able to fill that gap? So there's definitely an, an inequity in surgical care throughout the world, and that hasn't changed for many decades. Um, but now I think the ground is def definitely more fertile when it comes to um, trying to actually fill that gap and trying to understand that a little bit better. Um, over the last decade or so, there has been such a huge jump when it comes to global surgery and global neurosurgery, um, not just in research, but also um, in starting to recognize this as an important aspect of um, neurosurgical care in general. Um, so one of the main things that came out um, was the um, um, LASA Commission on Global Surgery, and that kind of served as a very big um, um, priority force, essentially, for people to recognize the importance of surgery, um, not just when it comes to, um, you know, treating specific conditions, but more about your life in general. And, you know, the life years that are lost when people are not able to get the surgery that they need and the economic impacts of that over the years on different countries. Um, so, you know, this was just so key when it looked at, you know, some of the things that can actually be done when you look at workforce training and education, um, the finance and economic aspects of things, healthcare delivery and management. And so they came up with these key messages with recommendations and indicators so that all across the board, all across the country, um, you know, countries that are interested can actually develop national surgical plans to be able to meet the needs um, for the demands. Um, and some of the key messages were related to, you know, access, you know, there are about 5 billion people worldwide who cannot access, you know, safe surgery when they need it. Um, and that has various reasons, whether it's delays in seeking care because you don't trust the care systems or it's financial situations. Um, there's a huge unmet need, definitely. And, you know, the poorest a third of the world's population only receives about 6.3% of um, the global um, surgical procedures that are performed. There's a huge financial risk um, when it comes to surgery. And, you know, in many places around the world, you have to provide the funds to have your surgery before your surgery can be done. Some places you literally need to go and you buy the equipment that you're going to is gonna be used for your surgery and bring it into the hospital um, before your surgery can be done. So these are things that, you know, you have to think about when it comes to financial risk protection for people who, who are undergoing surgery across the, across the globe. Um, there's definitely gonna be a cost of scale up and an, an economic impact for that, but it has been shown by research over the years in multiple countries that investing in surgery is affordable, it saves lives and it promotes economic growth. Um, and that's the thing that, you know, when you talk to stakeholders about, that's what they actually want to see. Where's the money going and how does it improve um, things for them? And surgery, at the end of the day, it's an indivisible, indispensable part of healthcare. And, you know, th there are many papers and, and research studies that you can bring out to support that case. Um, and that applies for neurosurgery as well. So when I did my um, my research for my master's, I went to the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Um, so <laughs> on the left is basically the very fancy, one of the fancy huts where I lived. Um, <laughs> they didn't tell me when I was going to do my research project that this was, a, I was going to be living in a game reserve, essentially, uh, which would have been a huge plus if I had known before that. But um, literally, I would wake up and there would be a giraffe, you know, sitting in a watering hole in front of my tent. So that was fun, um, seeing <laughs> different animals on your drive to your work, but, you know, very cool. Um, but at the end of the day, I was looking at trauma and avoidable deaths in this area in South Africa, and we used um, the in-depth network, which is um, basically a population um, health um, study that occurs throughout 
um, in multiple areas around the world. And it's longitudinal data that you gather for people throughout the years and you use that data for different things. But I was looking at trauma and avoidable deaths because you know, injuries cause about 6 million deaths every year. Um, and the burden is highest in low and middle income countries. And these are the countries that are the least equipped to deal with these. Um, and they're definitely inadequate emergency medical systems there. Um, so we use this in-depth network and we were basically looking at refining the definition of avoidable deaths and trauma and measuring that burden um, and examining the factors that contribute to delays in care. So there were different aspects that came into that project using verbal autopsy, literature reviews, doing um, key informants interviews with care providers there. But at the end of the day, you can come up with this three delays framework um, where people have delays in seeking care and reaching care and receiving care for many different reasons. And it can be applied worldwide. It doesn't have to be in a low, in a low income country or middle income country. It applies in every situation because every single country has places where people are disadvantaged or they are not able to receive the care that they need. So at the end of the day, we were able to find that a large percentage of injuries were actually avoidable. And those that were avoidable had a huge prominence of neurotrauma as well. Um, the third delay when it comes to actually receiving care was the largest contributor to avoidable deaths. Because you can imagine if you get to a care center and they don't have the tools or they don't have the surgical staff to be able to provide the care that you need, then all of that work in getting to care becomes kind of useless if you can't actually receive the care. Um, and so we developed, you know, avenues for improvements of the, for the health system that we were then able to provide and present to the stakeholders in those communities, and then kind of watch and monitor over the next few years in terms of what things are being put in place to address these. So whether it comes to developing the trauma system, um, looking at the pre-hospital trauma care for patients, and once they actually get into the hospital, you know, shortening the amount of time that it gets for them to get the care that they need and having adequately trained staff in the hospitals. Because, you know, at the end of the day, where you live shouldn't determine if you live, if you were to have, you know, a trauma or something like that happen. And, you know, people sometimes look at global neurosurgery and think it's just a problem of low and middle income countries, but it's definitely not. Um, you know, in the US, even living in Michigan here, if you go to different areas, like say Flint, Michigan, for example, um, there's a huge dis disadvantaged population who are, you know, really struggling when it comes to getting the care that they need for very, very different reasons. In multiple areas in Canada, across the board, very disadvantaged populations who, number one, can't get, get the care they need or just don't trust the health system and don't seek the care that they need. And so these are things that can be applied um, on a global scale, really. Um, so, you know, that led to some publications. And then um, this was us at the launch for the um, Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma in Cambridge. Um, and so the great thing about this was that it brought in neurosurgeons from and surgeons from across the globe. So um, you had representation of the people who, for whom a lot of these, you know, talks and, and things were happening for, because what usually happens is that you have research done in high income countries, and then they're supposed to be applied globally, but that doesn't really make sense because a low, in a lot of the low and middle income countries, they don't necessarily have the same tools. They don't have the same resources that you have in high income countries. And so you cannot apply the same research guidelines um, in these areas. So if you have these people in it from the ground up and building from the ground up, then you can kind of um, um, tweak your um, guidelines and your research to be able to accommodate that. So this was when we had the consensus meeting, for example, on the role of um, decompressive craniectomies for managing traumatic brain injuries. Um, so that was done at the same meeting in, in Cambridge. And from that came this you know, huge consensus statement that is now being used globally um, to decide about treatments for decompressive craniectomies and traumatic brain injuries across the globe. Um, so, you know, global neurosurgery started really picking up at that time. And 
The first actual global neurosurgery meeting happened in 2019 in New York. Um, and then, you know, from that, many different things um, coming across as well. In Canada, we have the Bethune Conference, which is kind of the global surgery um, conference um, for Canada. And neurosurgery has a big representation there as well. Um, so it's definitely something that is growing and changing and is becoming more important. I remember when I attended the Bethune meeting, I think it was in 2019 as well, um, but they had um, the heads of neurosurgery programs all across Canada. Um, I think um, the, um, the heads from Toronto and BC and Saskatchewan, I believe, were there. And the discussion was about actually making this a formal process for um, promotion in your neurosurgery career. So when you go into neurosurgery and you get a job, you have to pick you know, the other things that you're gonna be involved in, whether that's research. So are you gonna be an academic neurosurgeon? Are you gonna be an administrator? Are you gonna be an educator? Um, whatever the case may be. So now the thought is adding global neurosurgery as one of those tracks for um, um, promotion um, through your neurosurgery career. So, you know, for those who are interested or want to learn more, um, this is definitely a big avenue of, of growth for neurosurgery. Um, and there are many different ways that you can get um, involved. Um, there are many different research collaboratives in Canada, in the US, and all over the world, um, looking to global surgery and global neurosurgery. Um, there are ways to get involved from a clinical aspect, to provide clinical care worldwide, or to be involved in um, collaborative research projects worldwide. Um, so there are def definitely many ways to get involved. Um, so if you're interested, um, you know this is something that you should start looking into. But um, that's it for me. That's the end of my talk. So happy to take any more questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Eden. That was a perfect uh, um, presentation. I learned a lot about the global surgery, women in neurosurgery, and also I really enjoyed um, hearing from your trajectory. So now we open the stage to the questions. Please raise your hand uh, or just open your mic if you have any further question to ask. I'm just also going to add that one of our co-founders, Pedro Menza, here joining us from the OR. So just giving him a moment to, to say hi. Uh, hi, Dr. Adam. So, so sorry that I couldn't be here for most of the talk. Uh, we, I'm just in the OR. We just finished with the case. I just joined when I could. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Maybe I can start asking a question. So you mentioned that you had an elective um, in Africa, I guess, when you, when you did your residency. So mm -hmm. I, I was wondering that how, how much elective you can get out of your school to just try to work in other, uh, other countries or other hospitals to get a sense of working as a global neurosurgery. Um, so my elective was actually in medical school. So that was an elective that I did during the summer of one of the years in medical school. But when it comes to global neurosurgery, um, it depends on the school that you're in. If you're thinking about taking elective time to do um, um, international electives. So my program was very open to international collaborators. So um, in neurosurgery in general, you have about a period of a year almost, nine months to a year, where you can do electives and you don't have to stay in Canada for those electives. If you form relationships or you know of a neurosurgeon in Canada who goes to other areas um, to operate or to teach or to do research, you can um, you can set up a relationship with that and set up a time to go with them for say like a month or two months, um, as long as you clear it with your program director um, in your residency. So, you know, I've had people, you know, go and travel with some neurosurgeons to um, places like Uganda or Rwanda or um, Kenya or um, Thailand or whatever the case may be, as long as you inform your program directors ahead of time and you actually have a structured plan as to what you're going to be doing while you're there. That's the most important thing because they don't want you to just go and you're just twiddling your thumb and sitting around doing nothing for two months. You have to show that based on, you know, what this other surgeon has been exposed to in the past or what they've done in the past, you'll be able to do 
this amount of cases or see these amounts of patients in the year. It's always busy when you do international electives, if you're going with someone who's doing you know, a structured program or if they've been there before, especially, and they're known or trusted in that region, you will never not be busy. Um, so it's more about you know, choosing the projects that you actually are interested in and the ones that you do wanna pursue. Um, but there's always there's always stuff to do and there's always room to allow you to do it. So when you're a resident, if you're doing an international elective, you still get your usual pay and support and everything else. Sometimes you may have to um, kind of fund a little bit or get some extra funding for the travel and the expenses related to that. But if you're frugal, a lot of the, the pay that you get usually as a resident would take you very far in planning and doing all of that as well. And some programs will actually have um, grants um, for um, travel um, and grants for international collaboratives and international work. So there's always ways for you to be able to fund that, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. One question I could ask you is, how do you feel in terms of your preferences practicing neurosurgery? I mean, you were trained almost predominantly in Canada, and then you went to the States. So um, how do you assess the, the research landscape in clinical and basic science in the States? And, and what is your preference uh, living in the States versus being in Ontario, Canada? Um, so coming to the States wasn't really a plan for me initially. Um, I came here for my fellowship. And then the time when you usually, you know, you're applying for jobs and interviewing for jobs, for me, happened to be right when COVID started. So all of the jobs that were possibly available in Canada kind of disappeared. And so the question at that time was, do you go and do another fellowship, two more fellowships and waiting to see if positions will then come up over time as you wait in Canada? And the other thing you have to be really realistic about jobs in Canada is that we definitely train more neurosurgeons than there are jobs in Canada. So a lot of the times, more than 50% of neurosurgery trainees from Canada end up working in the States and other places. So um, not only do you have to think about whether do you want an academic practice or community practice in Canada, but you also have to be realistic of, you know, where are you going to work when you're done your training? Um, when I started, everyone told me, you know, there are no jobs in neurosurgery. Why are you doing neurosurgery? And I thought, oh, by the time I'm done, there will be definitely be more jobs in general. And it didn't really change much, honestly, over the six years when I was a resident. So um, <laughs> um, you kind of have to be a bit realistic when it comes to that. So for me personally, it became a decision of, do I want to do two more fellowships while I wait or do I want to start working? And for me, I wanted to start working. So then a job in, 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 in the US became a possibility and because I'd done my fellowship here as well. Um, when it comes to the surgery landscape, whether it's for basic science or clinical research, um, there are definitely more opportunities in the U.S. just because the sheer number of places um, compared to Canada. There are definitely more institutions in the U.S. than there are in Canada. And there are institutions that are targeted for like everything you could imagine, whatever research you want to do, whatever clinical or basic science thing you want to do, there's availability for that in more spots than there are in, um, in Canada. But at the end of the day, there's still competition for all of it. So, you know, there are um, people who are trained in the U.S. who are going for those jobs as well. So um, it's, it's, I think at the end of the day, it depends on where you land because every place is so different. Um, even in, say, like a province like Ontario, there's a wide variety of what's available for clinical research and basic science research. Um, same thing occur occurs here in, in the U.S., um, in Michigan. So I don't know what my career is going to look like in terms of where I am, say, in five years or 10 years. I'm in Michigan now, but at the end of the day, I always kind of wanted to work in Canada, but I also wanted to work internationally. So who knows where I'm going to be in the next five or 10 years. But at the end of the day, I think you can find what you want to do wherever you go, um, as long as you kind of make the right partnerships and collaborations that are needed for that. 
pretty fair. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. If there aren't any questions, maybe I can ask a quick question. Um, so, uh, with uh, you know, as a group, um, you know, with CAMSIGN, uh, mm -hmm. representing, you know, the uh, uh, in national interest group of medical students. I'm wondering, Dr. Adam, if you had any suggestions how we can, you know, promote more global neurosurgery for medical students and interest in medical students to learn more about it and how mm -hmm. you'd advise us to, uh, as a group, to provide, you know, more learning opportunities uh, for students uh, who are interested in that front. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, there are many different kind of um, global surgery initiatives going on in Canada, in the US and worldwide. So I think, you know, initially it's just about exposure. So, um, you know, social media, or whatever you guys use for your presentations and your talks and your advertisements for that. Um, just, you know, giving some information about different global surgery initiatives. So you could do something where, you know, every week you post something about a global surgery initiative or a global neurosurgery initiative or about research that one of the global um, neurosurgeons is doing um, in Canada or in the U.S. or abroad. Um, and you kind of draw people in that way initially. And then when people are interested, you know, you can get them linked up with different um, people who are actually doing the work. Um, so one of the things that I really liked about Queens was that they had a um, they had a global surgery initial global health initiative that was part of the medical school training there, um, and so that was a very kind of in your face, this is available to you at any point. And if you're interested, you can go ahead and learn more and join and go and do the travel. So a lot of the times people just don't know. And if you don't tell them, um, they don't know if they're interested or not, and it doesn't pique their curiosity. So I think it's about, you know, just make bringing the information to the forefront and, you know, making a concerted effort to do that repeatedly um, to get people's interests. Um, you can invite speakers um, that are known in global surgery and global neurosurgery um, and just have them give talks about, you know, what they've done in the past and what they're planning to do in the future. Um, and I think, you know, that would be a good way to kind of get started. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I guess a follow up to that is, uh, and, I, and I apologize if this question is redundant. Uh, you might have discussed this in your in your presentation, but um, how do you how do you imagine you know global neurosurgery changing within the next ten years or so? Uh, I'm curious to to see what you what you think about that. Yeah, I'm hoping that it comes a time where. Um, you know, the research into global surgery and global neurosurgery is something that is better recognized across Canada and across the U.S., especially when it comes to, you know, um, getting, you know, promotions when you get hired in neurosurgery, for example, so that it becomes one of those avenues for um, um, promotion in, in your job in general in neurosurgery. So, the research aspect of it is definitely growing. And I see that becoming even more prominent over the next five to 10 years, but not just the research because it's more about making that research you know, readily available and um, very obvious to people. Um, so it's, it's more about the political priority for global neurosurgery. So there are different actions, different ideas, different windows of opportunity that need to be kind of capitalized on for that to really happen, um, where to where it gets sort of a, a name and a prominence where people look at it and they think, oh, this isn't something that just a small group of people do, but, you know, it's something that, you know, everyone should be interested in and, you know, something that is promoted, something that's rewarded, something that is interactive and, you know, really does get people involved. I hope there comes a time where, you know, if a resident or someone said that they were interested in global neurosurgery, that they had multiple options just in their own training program of how to get involved. That for me, that would be the, the wonderful kind of grassroots change to see 
where that there, you know, so many people who are involved already, whether it's coming from a research perspective, a clinical perspective, an education perspective, whatever the case may be, but you have different kind of connections that you can build into global neurosurgery. And then that just continues to feed the system over the years. Um, that's really the part of, of global neurosurgery that I'm interested in and that I hope to see a change in over the years. And on the grand scale of things, there are many changes happening kind of, you know, from the World Health perspective, um, from the WHO, the World Health Assembly, the World Bank, and all of these things that are, you know, changing to try to um, increase the prominence of global surgery and surgery in general. Um, and now there are key leaders in those avenues who are also happen to be neurosurgeons. So, you know, that is a huge opportunity to increase the prominence of global neurosurgery. And I hope that we're able to capitalize on that. And I think, you know, that was sort of happening um, very well and going on a good path until COVID happened. And it kind of really slowed down that, um, um, that progress a little bit, um, not being able to travel to a lot of places and a lot of people not being able to, you know, have those partnerships and collaboratives that they've been doing over the years but I hope that you know as this settles down that you know we're able to pick that up more and you know that process can basically get stronger over the years yeah certainly I think uh, it'll be very exciting uh, for I think in the future for uh, residents who are interested in pursuing like or being involved in global neurosurgery to have those uh uh, opportunities available to them readily. Uh, I think that's very exciting. And I'm ho hoping that opens up <laughs> in the near yeah. future too. Thank you. No problem.